Well, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to our annual budget briefing put on by our market intelligence team here at Emix Group. This is our FY14 DOD budget briefing. Actionable intelligence for the IT product community. Most of you know, we here at Emix Group are all about helping technology companies grow their business in the government hardware manufacturers, software publishers, and increasingly cloud service providers. Since 1997, we've been providing a mix of services to help companies grow their business, and over the years, we've matured those offerings into what we now call our government aggregation platform, increasing revenue, programs to support the demand creators, whether it's your own sales organization or trusted partners, all within a government business infrastructure that operates efficiently, processes that are constantly improving and becoming more automated. We've organized ourselves along the chronology of a sales cycle. Market intelligence, where is the likely fit for your product or technology-based service? Marketing, messaging to attract attention, create desire and generate leads, all for the purpose of helping those technology companies that we represent grow their business, increase revenue, and provide our government customers trusted operations consistent with their rules so that they can do business with confidence, the partners they trust, and the contract vehicles they prefer. That's us in a nutshell. And this morning, you're going to hear from the leaders of our market intelligence team, our DOD team, Tim Larkins and Lloyd McCoy, as they summarize some of the big programs. Can't touch everything here in an hour and a half, but they're going to do their best to give you as much as possible. Tim Larkins is manager of our market intelligence team here at Emix Group, bringing us an MBA and 10 years of experience in business development, market research, and strategic opportunity identification. Tag teaming in the presentation with him, Lloyd McCoy, our senior DOD analyst, prior, who prior to joining Emix Group in 2012, spent eight years as an analyst with DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency. His academic background includes a bachelor's in pol political science as well as a master's degree in public policy and strategic intelligence. Take it away, Tim. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good Got to say that we are excited. Welcome to Image Group's FY14 DOD budget briefing. Um, I'm excited because I'm from St. Louis. Maybe Lloyd can't share this excitement, but the Cardinals made it into the World Series <laughs> starting tomorrow. Pretty pumped. Any Boston fans out there? All right, all right. Well, good luck to you guys, but not as much luck to the Cardinals as to the Cardinals. Um, also, I think there's another piece of news that I'm leaving out that happened recently. Oh, Congress passed the CR and suspended the debt ceiling, so we all get to keep our jobs. Give a hand to our lawmakers. <laughs> Woo! All right. Now, seriously though, folks, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces. I know a lot of you have been to our briefings in the past, so you know that. The purpose of the briefing is for us to provide actionable intelligence to the IT product community to arm you uh, for, uh, for more success in federal sales in the coming year. Now, taking a look at our agenda here, we'll be starting off with a glimpse at the budget requests and then the CR. Then we'll take a look at the drivers that are impacting IT procurement across DOD, and then we'll dive into the agencies themselves. Now, as always, if the font size is too small on any of the slides here, as it will be, don't worry, you can follow along with the handouts you received on your way in. Uh, the folks on WebEx have it in front of their screens. Additionally, all these slides will be included in the territory planner that you'll receive upon completion of the survey after you leave here today. Now remember that the planner is going to include all of these slides and additionally, it'll, it'll contain information on IT insertion points, org charts, opportunities, and points of contact that we don't have time to cover here. So the territory planner is definitely a useful tool um, to help you plan for the year. Now we wanted to start off by taking a quick look at the budgets from a high level perspective. And this first chart here represents the total addressable federal IT market. And I'm sure a lot of you are looking at this and saying, but I thought the IT budget was only $82 billion. And you would be correct. 
see while the, AT, the IT budget is $82 billion, there's an additional $6 billion that's, uh, inc that's included in here for Intel agencies. And then don't forget all the investments that are made for RDT&E, C4ISR, and all of that technology that's embedded into weapons systems. So all told, the total federal addressable IT market is 120 to $130 billion. Um, now we feel confident in this estimate as it does align with the contract data that we have. So the government does obligate about half a trillion dollars every year on contracts, um, about 120 billion of which is dedicated to IT. And that 120 billion obviously comes out of a larger bucket. This pyramid contains the White House requested levels for FY14. Obviously, there's a big gap between overall and discretionary spending, and that's because mandatory funds largely stay the same. If you're going to have spending cuts, they mostly come out of the discretionary budget. And the CR funds discretionary uh, funding, uh, discretionary levels at $986.3 billion. Um, that's $19 billion higher than post-sequestration BCA caps. Um, also, the base DOD budget you see there um, that's allocated by the uh, CR, I should note, does not include OCO funding in military construction. Uh, the shutdown that, la that started on October 1st lasted about 16 days. Uh, and as the closure continued, services contractors uh, felt a pinch. Most of the large contractors have uh, revenue targets they need to meet on a, need to hit on a quarterly basis. And only so many billable hours exist. So every day the government didn't pay was another day they didn't make any money. Not that we enjoy seeing other companies in pain, uh, but the software and hardware industry was relatively less impacted by the shutdown. Because at the end of the day, if an agency needs storage, routers, or cybersecurity licenses, they're still going to buy them. And on a side note, as Tim noted in his sequestration briefing back in March, the debt ceiling debate is really at the heart of sequestration and the reason why we're seeing declining budgets. So until we get our debt under control, uh, flat is the new up. And in light of the shutdown and the most recent budget battles, we wanted to further illustrate just how disjointed and just how off our budget planning process really has become. Um, so we'd like to share two different takes on budget forecasts. Uh, what you see here is a chart depicting OMB's forecast for procurement budgets over the next several years. Um, OMB is predicting 5% annual growth for uh, procurement budgets. So beginning in FY14, the procurement budget request is $99 billion. Um, looking out into FY18, the procurement budget request is predicted to be $123 billion, and that represents a 25% uh, increase across the five years. Now, obviously, OMB isn't going to predict a recession. It behooves them to be as optimistic as possible when we're talking about the outlook of the economy in the future years. The problem with this is that these budget requests, they, they just are out of touch. They don't factor sequestration in, um, and I'm sure many of you can agree with me when I say that we've seen budgets be flat if not decline over the past couple of years. And to back that statement up, you can see here that DOD spending has in fact dropped significantly over the past four years. Um, and in fact, all of our models and all of our forecasts show DOD budgets dropping at least until 2018, if not until 2023. Now, O&M and personnel uh, accounts, they will actually increase over the years, uh, but DOD base budgets, or I'm sorry, DOD procurement budgets will decrease um, continuously. Uh, now this, this slide I do have to say um, reflects FY14 budget requests. We unfortunately didn't have time to work in the CR numbers and we had no real reason to expect that Congress would comply with the post sequestration BCA caps so we didn't use those numbers either. So this does, re this does reflect the FY14 request and leveraging a Kager method you can see that procurement money is expected to fall below 2023 over the next, uh, I'm sorry, but below 2003 levels over the next nine years. Now, I don't want to raise alarms here. Um, I don't think that this means industry needs to be in a panic, and you'll see why in a couple of slides. Here we have a breakdown of military base budgets by uh, department. And you can see that Navy is slated to receive the largest uh, base budget in FY14 among the services with about 156 billion. Uh, Army took a bit of a hit, uh, dropping from 135 billion last year to 129. Uh, Air Force requested about 114 billion. And that defense-wide bucket you see over there, that covers all the other OSD agencies, and they're slated to receive about $97 billion or so in funding. And we can see that, with the exception of the Navy, IT budgets across DOD are actually increasing. So that's great news for us. Um, we have seen agencies become more frugal with each purchase. We have seen agencies become increasingly hungry for best value solutions that help them to achieve mission effectiveness. But we've also seen them be recognize that COTS products can deliver what they're looking for more often than not. 
So as we've stated in past briefings, the IT product community is in a relatively good place right now. And now that we've taken a look at the budget landscape and um, the money DOD will have to buy your products um, for the year, let's discuss some of the element that, elements that will be impacting how uh, the agencies will be buying. Last year's National Defense Authorization Act included language that was impactful to the uh, IT product community and that it required that DOD uh, develop and implement a software assurance policy uh, for the entire life cycle of covered systems. And this means that anyone selling to DOD will have to have a way to identify and remediate vulnerabilities in their products. And it's also telling agencies that they have to use COTS products unless they can make a compelling argument against using them. After combing through the FY14 NDAA, perhaps the most relevant sections to us are those proposing a cloud service working capital fund that will allow more flexibility and cost benefits for agencies. Also, there's language requiring the President and the Secretary of Defense to establish a strategy to deter enemies in cyberspace. And the document also includes an enhancement provision which ramps up military spending to include an additional $1.8 billion for O&M accounts to reverse problems created by sequestration. And another impactful piece of policy to come out of DOD this year is the DOD Strategic Management Plan. And the plan is designed to create an effective business operation that enables the warfighter over the year. Now this plan proposes four strategic goals that are listed here on the slide to guide DOD's investments across FY14. Now the plan advocated for building more agile and secure information capabilities, especially with respect to financial applications. Additionally, it, it suggested improving DOD's acquisition culture uh, by further using shared acquisition vehicles for software and hardware. The strategic management plan states that, quote, the department must rely on best value COTS products. We all know that the agency is already using COTS products to consolidate data centers, operation centers, and help desks to improve information access and security. Now, DOD has been consolidating for years through individual component activities and broader department efforts. So think Navy's NMCI or DIS's Defense Enterprise Computing Centers or DECs. But now, DOD CIO's office is working to consolidate services. And as we all know, this started with the shift to enterprise email. Now, this, this, these standardization and consolidation efforts will allow DOD to improve business operations and share information without the limitation of silos. And it's this idea of sharing information uh, without the limitation of silos that's resonating across the entire department. Now, if you've spoken with leadership from any of the service branches, from DISA or from the Joint Chiefs, you'll know that the Joint Information Environment, or the JIE, uh, has been and remains a key priority for them. And DOD Strategic Management Plan references the JIE extensively. So we've gotten a lot of people in recent months asking us what the GIE is. And uh, so I'll re it repeats some of the points we made at last year's briefing, which incidentally you can find on our website. Uh, first off, GIE is not a funded program. Uh, it's not a network. Uh, it's a framework or a construct that when leveraged across the DOD services uh, will allow them to converge to a uh, common vision of unified capabilities. Uh, this will ensure DOD has the most efficient, interoperable and efficient and secure solutions possible. And this effort is managed by a tri-chair uh, committee that's made up of the DOD CIO, uh, the J6, and the Cybercom commander. The first component of the JIE, uh, what they're calling uh, Enterprise Operating Centers, uh, stood up in Germany on July 31st. And this was the first real step forward uh, towards realizing the JIE vision. And the JIE infrastructure is going to leverage common standards regardless of service provider or mission specific utilization. Now back over the summer, of course, Terry Takai selected DISA as the exclusive provider of core data centers. And these core data centers are going to be the DISA DEX. Um, the, so the DEX will form the backbone of the JIE. Now the department believes that the core data center framework is going to lead to significant savings um, by cutting down on wasted or underutilized IT infrastructure. And the JIE is designed in part to leverage mobility and to bring garrison to the edge capabilities. So uh, this means that information can be available anywhere. And at this point, securing mobile devices, um, including their apps, emails, and other functions, as well as the wireless networks that support them, is an important first step towards realizing mobility. To capitalize on the JIE's enterprise capabilities, DOD needs to have the necessary security parameters and adaptability and DISA is working on this effort for the department. So much of the vision for the JIE depends on the development of an enterprise cloud environment, which is part of DOD's cloud computing strategy that they released last July. 
Uh, DOD, of course, began working to shift its operations to the web long before JIE arrived on the scene, but the cloud strategy formally aligns its cloud computing planning and implementation efforts with the larger aims of the JIE. And one of the major components of the JIE is a single security architecture. Uh, this will, it's designed to allow DOD cyber operators at every level to see the status of their networks. Uh, department wants the ability to know who is operating on, an, operating on its networks and what they're doing. And the single security architecture describes how core DOD data centers and the server computing resources they contain, how they must be structured, what cyber defenses are required on those computers, and what detection and diagnosis capabilities that data center must have. So we spent a fair amount of time covering it just because the GIE is one of the most important drivers affecting IT procurement across DOD this year. Um, so you'll see it reflected across all of DOD's budgets and in most of their investments. So definitely keep an eye out for those requirements that we talked about that will contribute to the realization of the GIE, like infrastructure consolidation, mobility, big data, and common operating environments. So we'll jump into the Air Force right now and see what its plans are for FY14. And in the coming year, the Air Force requested a base budget of $114 billion, uh, which is about a 3.5% increase from last year's request. Now, this year, about 40% of the base budget is going to be spent on O&M. Uh, about a quarter will be spent on personnel, and then about 17% will be spent on procurement. Now, Air Force's IT budget request for FY14 is also about um, a 4% increase from last year at $5.5 billion. Now you'll notice that we've broken the IT budget down into two buckets over here, DME and SS. For those of you that aren't familiar with these terms, DME stands for Development, Modernization, and Enhancement. You might know that as uh, CapEx money because traditionally it's been used for capital expenditures or new purchases. SS stands for Steady State. Um, you might know Steady State as OPEX because it's traditionally been used for operations and maintenance purchases to kind of keep the lights on. Um, now, over the past few years, we've seen DOD sort of s shift their buckets of money from, DO, uh, from DME into steady state. But that being said, uh, we are seeing about a 5% increase in Air Force DME funds for the year. So it's actually great to see an increase there. Um, now, referencing this table at the bottom half of the slide, you'll notice a column labeled primary BRM service. Now, BRM stands for business reference model, which describes the core function that an investment performs. Now the reason that BRMs are important is because if the government's labeling an investment with, say, infrastructure, it might be important for uh, a rep who sells infrastructure products to hunt in that particular program. Now you can see that the IT infrastructure and maintenance BRM is, is by far the largest primary BRM with the, within the Air Force, followed by command and control. Um, in terms of addressable market within the Air Force, I've seen some estimates put it for IT at around $15.5 billion in FY14. Uh, with that addressable market for software products in about the $2 billion range. And forecasts for the products market will remain at about $2 billion over the next four or five years within the Air Force. So it's good to see some consistency there. And these products are being purchased from a number of IT um, insertion points across the Air Force enterprise. And we'll cover some of the same offices we discussed last year at a high level because there have been so many personnel changes um, recently. Uh, we wanted to take a moment though and look into a couple of other components that haven't gotten quite as much attention in the past. Starting with Air Force ISR. So Lieutenant General Bob Otto is the Deputy Chief of Staff for Air Force ISR at the Pentagon. Now including blue, non-blue, and intel funds, um, he manages a $55 billion budget and 30,000 personnel across five directorates. Now one of these directorates is the Air Force ISR agency, providing applications, cyber resources, and other ISR products across the Air Force. Now, the ISR components within the Air Force are charged with collecting all real-time satellite data to improve our situational awareness in theater. Of course, once that data is collected, it has to be secured, tagged, managed, stored, accessed, and accessed from a common operating environment. So uh, when I hear customers talk about this type of thing, my ears perk up because I think about all the opportunities that our clients have to sell into this space. Um, so anybody selling applications related to GIS or middleware, BI or analytics, um, of course, storage, virtualization, or systems development companies are going to find opportunities to influence requirements coming out of these ISR offices here. Now, unfortunately, one of the problems that the Air Force keeps running into is that they just don't have adequate acquisition capabilities to deliver on the ISR cap solutions that they need. Um, I was talking to Major General Ed Wilson, Director of Air Force Space Operations, and he said that Air Force really needs um, uh, uh, serious reform on its acquisition standards because buying these types of products has just been way too slow 
and completely ineffective. Now I assume this will be one of the topics that they address at the Air Force ISR Industry Day. That's coming up um, next Thursday, October 31st in Springfield, Virginia. You can check uh, AVCIA's events page for more information on that event. Now one component that we did cover last year, of course, was uh, the Information Dominance A6 Office of the Air Force. Uh, I did talk to General Baslow, who's of course their CIO, a couple of months back. And I can tell you that his major concerns are pretty much the same as any other six. Increasing savings through common standards, leveraging uh, open architecture, strategic sourcing, and um, more heavily leveraging shared services. Now over the next 18 months, Air Force will facilitate common hosting standards for all non-weapon systems, and they're currently working on an aerial internet platform so planes can share more information with each other from the air. Again, leveraging common platforms and hosting standards. Now all of these efforts are steps towards realizing the GIE. And the Air Force would not be equipped to carry out these initiatives without Air Force Materiel Command, located at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, Materiel Command is headed by General Janet Wolfenbarger, and it consists of five centers and 21 staff directorates. Now, one of those directorates is the Life Cycle Management Center. Here's a look at the Life Cycle Management Center, also based at Wright-Pat. Uh, this center, as its name would suggest, uh, leads a life cycle management mission, including acquisition and support technology, uh, the LCMC manages 450 investment programs and 500, 500 sustainment programs. As you can see, there are 10 PEOs, including battle management, C3INN, and BES. And we will cover a few of those PEOs today just because they do deserve some attention. And PEO C3INN is probably the most exciting one because anything related to Air Force infrastructure runs here. Anything related to JIE implementation is run out of here. Uh, everything that they do is with the JIE in mind so that the Air Force won't have a huge need to change anything when JIE standards become mandatory. Now there have been several organizational changes at C3INN including the consolidation of the Crypto Systems Division into the Responsive Cyber Division under Colonel Chris Kinney. Uh, the AFNET infrastructure work is now falling under Mike Kaplan in the C3I infrastructure branch. And the GCSS branch is now under the Commoditized Infrastructure Branch headed by Mike Clark. Also, the Architecture and Standards Division was discussed, or was consolidated into the Infrastructure Division this year under Colonel Bill Polakowski. And Colonel Polakowski and I discussed a couple of weeks ago the Air Force's plan to reduce data centers from the existing 520 down to 345. Uh, their plan is to begin shifting focus to five medium-sized data centers called Area Processing Centers, or APCs. And these APCs will be located at five strategic locations, um, Andrews Air Force Base, McConnell, McGee Tyson, Scott, and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So it's important to note those uh, locations. The second PEO of note is Battle Management up at Hanscom. Uh, PEO Battle Management is now run by Steve Wart and is responsible for mission planning, uh, theater C4, C4 uh, strategic surveillance, and intelligence. So anything that has to do with aerospace management, precision engagement, or communications and controls weapon systems would be developed and acquired through this office. PEOBM runs 311 major and non-major programs like the Mission Planning System, TBMCS, and the Air Force Weather Weapon System. And the last significant PEO of note is Business Enterprise Systems, which delivers contracting and program management for 128 programs. It's got an annual budget of about a billion dollars and employs around 2,300 people out at Maxwell Air Force Base. Now their, their focus is on logistics and business sustainment, enterprise operations, uh, enterprise services and operations. And, and their main effort this year is going to be on improving infrastructure modernization through programs like DEEMS and AFIPS. So anybody selling products related to BPM, PLM, ERP, AppDev, and SOA uh, would do well to attack opportunities out of BES. Now we spent a fair amount of time diving into Spacecom last year, uh, so we won't spend too much time here. It's just important to note that this MAGCOM, located at Peterson Air Force Base and commanded by General William Shelton, uh, delivers space and cyberspace capabilities to the Joint Warfighting Team. SpaceCom employs over 42,000 people uh, in, in 134 locations worldwide. And Brigadier General uh, Wooten, Kevin Wooten, runs SpaceCom's A6, and he manages an $11.4 billion space and cyberspace portfolio. They also work with the 14th and 24th Air Forces to support Cybercom and Stratcom. And speaking of the 24th Air Force, there have been some major changes this year, so we'll cover those briefly. Um, so as you all know, the 24th Air Force, or F-Cyber, is the operational warfighting 
organization that defends Air Force's networks and protects U.S. interests in cyberspace. Of course, Aft Cyber was supposed to become a major command, uh, but in 2008, the 24th was given responsibility of the cyber warfare mission. They employ over 5,400 people, and they're based out of Lackland Air Force Base. And as I mentioned previously, there have been some several changes at the 24th this year, so I'll run through them quickly. Major General Kevin McLaughlin replaced Major General Suzanne Valtrineau as commander of the 24th in June. Lieutenant Colonel Eric Delange replaced Colonel Cynthia Wright at the 38th. Lieutenant Colonel Bradley Pyburn replaced Colonel Alan Berry at the 624th in July. And the 689th Combat Comms Wing at Robbins and the 3rd Combat Comms Group at Tinker were both deactivated in September which left the 5th Combat Comms Group to take over control of all combat communications. And the 5th is now a direct reporting unit to the 24th. Now, AFCYBER has been pushing Air Force leaders to allocate more funds to cyber operations. In order to maintain effectiveness and secure superiority, more investment in this space will be required. So I think it goes without saying that if you're selling infrastructure and cybersecurity related products, Spacecom and AFCYBER are the components you'll want to focus on to influence requirements and secure funding. And now we'll move on to some of the contracts that the Air Force prefers to leverage uh, for its acquisitions. Now, you'll notice that on all the contracts and contractor slides, um, we're referencing FY12 numbers. The reason for that is due to the reporting, de the reporting delay um, that DOD has in reporting its, uh, its acquisitions. So that makes the FY13 data incomplete. So we wanted to give you a full year picture of their spending. So the Air Force does obligate between 65 and 70 billion dollars on contracts a year and the agency uses a wide variety of them. Uh, you can see here that NetSense is leveraged for about 1.8 billion dollars a year and GSA Schedule 70 leveraged for about half a billion. But these two vehicles combined only account for a little over 3 percent of total Air Force contract spending. Now like other DOD agencies, Air Force is heavily leveraging BPAs off of initiatives like the Enterprise Software Initiative or ESI for which MX Group has been uh, the leading vendor over the past four years. And uh, referencing back to NetSense, of course, we're all aware of the many delays that have plagued this contract vehicle over the last several years. Um, but we are happy to say that MX Group was one of the 16 awardees on the NetSense 2 products contract. Um, now, there have been more protests, but we're optimistic that the Air Force uh, will take corrective action soon so that it'll be open for business in the next few months. Um, so uh, clients and, and partners, stay tuned for details from our programs team as we roll out this vehicle. Now, one other contract vehicle of note for the Air Force is the CS-TATS vehicle. Um, that stands for Cyber Security and Information Systems Technical Areas Tasks, CS-TATS. Now, it'll be a five-year MAC with a $2 billion ceiling that'll buy software and services related to information assurance, network security, and modeling and simulation. A draft RFP is expected this winter with an award expected in the spring of 2015, so keep your eyes peeled for CS-TATS. Now here's a glimpse of the Air Force top contractors. You can see that the F-35 and the F-22 programs have benefited Lockheed and Boeing enormously um, because those two companies combined have earned more revenue over the past three years than the next 18 companies combined. Uh, now these, co these companies may offer teaming opportunities to product manufacturers um, that, so you can take advantage of their relationships and or contract vehicles. Now let's discuss some of the major challenges and initiatives uh, that the Air Force is facing this year that would drive the purchase of more hardware and software. The Air Force has linked many of its major investments with strategic priorities like strengthening the nuclear enterprise, building networks that ensure data safety and data sharing, and increasing funding for cybersecurity and C2 capabilities. Additional funding uh, increases are going to benefit struggling ERP and management systems, as well as modernization of tactical communication infrastructure. One of the most relevant uh, funding increases uh, will benefit software manufacturers because the Air Force needs help replacing antiquated or malfunctioning network infrastructure and security programs and equipment. Also, the Air Force's budget request for the year calls out the need to leverage more COTS products and COTS technologies for IT programs, quote, to reduce time and development expenses incurred when acquiring new services. Of course, we can't talk about DOD drivers without mentioning cost cutting. So the Air Force is taking measures to limit spending and increase return on investment by leveraging partnerships with Army and DISA. Just this August, DISA reached an agreement with Army and Air Force to improve network bandwidth and security while realizing $1.2 billion in cost avoidance. 
Additionally, the Army has made an investment into the consolidation of hundreds of network security stacks and boiled them down to 15 regional security stacks, which the Air Force will also be leveraging to increase network speeds, speeds and improve enterprise capabilities. So we've taken a look at some of the budgets, we've taken a look at some of the organizations and the drivers that are affecting IT procurement, so now let's take a look at some of the investments that the Air Force will be making this year, starting with DEEMS. Uh, DEEMS is one of the Air Force's two major ERPs run out of PEO, BES. Of course, AFIPS is the other major ERP, which is run by Program Manager Tom Davenport. But where AFIPS is the continuation of the old Dimers program that provides integrated personnel and pay records for the Air Force, DEEMS is actually a financial system that leverages COTS software uh, to replace legacy systems. Now, Transcom, DFAST, and Air Force will use DEEMS uh, to provide consolidated bills, command budget prep and execution, and accurate financial statements. Now, there has been some controversy over DEEMS over the past few years because operational assessments of the program concluded that DEEMS is, quote, neither operationally effective nor operationally suitable, neither making sufficient progress towards achieving audit readiness nor towards achieving full financial auditability. Ouch. Um, but thus far, the system is operational at Scott and McConnell Air Force bases and DFAS centers in Maine and Ohio. Now, the plan for DEEMS is to achieve audit readiness and to be deployed worldwide by 2016. So that's really the primary need um, that COTS manufacturers can address here. You know, how can you help them to achieve audit readiness? How can you help them to consolidate legacy systems, integrate, manage, and secure data, and help them re-engineer business processes and find accurate reporting capabilities? Those are the solutions that Shirley Reed and Pat Hagen really want to hear about. Now, switching gears to a more infrastructure heavy investment. Um, the Base informa Information Infrastructure Program supports the AFNET and Information Transport System through hardware and software maintenance and repair, as well as software license agreements, as well as network security. In the past year, BII replaced network infrastructure components at Lackland, McDill, Laughlin, Cannon, and Ilsen Air Force Bases. Uh, efforts continue at Dias and Masawa Air Force Bases and three more locations have been prioritized for FY14 that for the time being are being undisclosed. As Tim mentioned earlier, these types of infrastructure investments are all being run out of PEO c 3 inn up at Hanscom. So setting meetings with Lieutenant Colonel Jennifer Kralikowski in the base infrastructure branch of the C3I infrastructure division will be easier if you're on point with your messaging around SIM and network security data and information management, and network consolidation and modernization. And then the final Air Force investment we'll cover today is the Tactical Data Links program, um, also run out of PEO C3 INN. Tactical Data Links uh, facilitates the exchange of messages, radar target information, and satellite imagery and data. The purpose of the investment is to improve global, global connectivity and interoperability. We're starting to see a trend here. So this isn't the only Air Force investment that, that's designed to improve information and collection and dissemination, though. Investments like GCSS and the GBS programs are similar to tactical data links in that they provide combat support um, information and uh, video transmission. They transmit imagery and other large data files in support of joint military forces. And as we all know, um, joint efforts is where the, the DOD is headed. But in any case, the Tactical Data Links program has over $30 million in DME funds this year and will see a focus on upgrading digital network communications between older aircraft um, with newer aircraft, so older aircraft like the F-15 and F-16 with newer aircraft like the F-22 and F-35. So this program is overseen by Stan Newberry, who's actually an SESer out at Langley Eustis at the Air Force C-2 Integration Center. And on a side note, I talked to Brig Brigadier General Brian Killoff at, a, at an FC event a couple of weeks ago, and he said that everybody at the Pentagon, as well as those program folks down at Langley, are invested in this type of warfighting integration platform. So funding for these types of programs are going to remain relatively safe for the year. And now we'll transition to the Navy and Marine Corps. The Navy um, received the largest chunk of funding among the service branches in FY14. Um, base budget request of $156 billion is about even with last year. Um, the President's budget request for the Navy aims to shore up needed investment in key technological capa areas of capability and support the, support the Pentagon's um, broader strategy involving a shift to the Pacific theater. Of course, how fast we get there depends on the availability of resources and funding. And you'll notice O&M accounts uh, for over a quarter of the base budget, and about 18% is dedicated to procurement. Now, looking over at the IT budget, we actually face about an 8% drop from last year. 
This should come as no surprise as Navy CIO Terry Halverson has said repeatedly that the Navy needs to make cuts to the seven to eight billion dollars they spend on IT each year. To cut costs, the Navy is increasing its use of enterprise software licensing agreements and LPTA as an acquisition strategy. It's leaning on data center uh, and application consolidations as well as cloud adoption to squeeze out as much savings as possible. IT infrastructure maintenance dominates the BRM categories followed by battle space networks, logistics management, and C2. And this is in keeping with the major themes of DOD that we mentioned, common operating environments, infrastructure consolidation, and storage. These programs and buckets of money reside, for the most part, within the Navy and Marine Corps Systems Commands. The, the Navy's Systems Commands report to Naval Operations, and the Marine Corps Systems Command, or Mark Corps Syscom, reports to the Marine Corps Commandant. Now, these organizations are the department's acquisition commands and perform a variety of important functions, which we'll discuss uh, shortly with further information in the planner. Uh, the CIOs are uh, Terry Halverson. He's the Department of Navy CIO. Um, his deputy is Janice Haith, and her information dominance office resides within the Chief of Naval Operations. Also, Brigadier General Kevin Nally is the Marine Corps CIO. And the Naval Sea Systems Command is the largest of the Navy's five system commands and is headquartered here in the Washington Navy Yard. Now, in light of uh, the recent shootings there, um, uh, NAVSEA is considering dispersing some of its personnel, so not everyone will be operate, operating at the Navy Yard. But NAVSEA does have an annual budget of about $30 billion, which accounts for almost 20% of the Navy's total budget, uh, total base budget. Now, NAVSEA is responsible for the Navy ships, submarines, and their combat systems, and they also manage Seaport E, which of course is their, the Navy's largest IT contract vehicle. Now it's important to note what the systems commands do um, and what their focus areas are. The, the, the system commands are right there in the trenches developing the resources that the Navy needs to do its work. And one of the priorities over the next couple of years, like the Air Force and Army, is warfighting system commonality. So you definitely notice a trend there. Um, so NAVC is looking to industry for help in figuring out ways to standardize hardware and software components across combat systems to reduce costs and take advantage of a shared network environment. Now we're going to go ahead and move forward to the Naval Air Systems Command, which of course is located at Patuxent River. Now it purchases technology to support naval aviation and weapons systems. Um, major IT insertion points within NAVAIR are the PEOs highlighted here along the left side of your screen, um, as well as the Naval Air Warfare Center Aircraft Division, or NAWCAD. Now NAWCAD by itself has a $5 billion budget, which it spends on procurement and R&D for ship to shore to air integration and avionics. Uh, then Naval Supply Systems Command focuses on technology procurements to support global logistics, supply chain, and inventory management. So NAVSUP provides the information systems through its Business Systems Center, or BSC, um, and the BSC is, is responsible for designing, developing, and maintaining information systems that support the numerous CONUS and OCONUS activities in functional areas of logistics, transportation, finance, and accounting. Now, unlike mission-funded programs that receive appropriations directly from Congress, NAVSUP relies on its work, Naval Working Capital Fund, which actually relies on revenue from the services it provides, uh, much like DISA does. The Space and Naval Warfare Systems Command, or SPAWAR, uh, delivers IT products and services to the fleet and other DOD stakeholders. Uh, their main focus is on how to achieve efficiencies and savings to strengthen the program Na Navy cares most about. SPAWAR has plans to reduce the Navy's IT footprint via application and data center consolidation and improving interoperability. Of particular no interest to the product community will be the CIO office led by Kimberly Kessler. Uh, she's responsible for network management, information assurance, application and data management, and IT policy. SPAWAR has a close working relationship with PEO C4I and PEO EIS. Rear Admiral Boris Becker runs PEO C4I and is in charge of an office presiding over systems and programs that provide C4I to Navy assets afloat and ashore. PEO EIS, managed by Vic Gavin, administers a smaller number of programs, but many of them are quite large. Um, his office controls a $2 billion annual portfolio, and his office focuses on purchasing uh, commercial technologies for Navy's networks. Vic Gavin recently stated that the Navy has more of a business problem than a problem of technology. Uh, they own the business of submarines and torpedoes, but they don't own the best business practices for IT procurement. 
and they plan to realize incremental savings by continuing to leverage LPTA as an acquisition strategy in efficiently procuring COTS products. Just like anyone else, they want the best products, the best security, the most robust capabilities, uh, but all acquisition will be driven by cost. Marine Corps Systems Command is the acquisition branch of the Marine Corps for IT systems. And they purchased technology utilizing the Seaport E contract vehicle. It's commanded by Brigadier General Kelly, who answers directly to the four-star commandant of the Marine Corps. Uh, as you can see, I've highlighted, highlighted a couple of key uh, insertion points within the organization. Jim Smirchansky is the Deputy Commander of Systems Engineering, Interoperability, Architectures and Technology, or DC SIAT. His office is charged with ensuring Marine Corps systems interoperability with coalition and joint forces in pursuing S&T transition opportunities for Marine Corps systems. The CIO for the command is Lieutenant Colonel Jamie Marcole. In addition to running the Marine Corps uh, data center operations teams, he works in close collaboration with General Nally towards strengthening cyber security management and technical controls for the protection of mission essential systems. Also, the Marine Corps Enterprise Information Technology Services Program, or MCEATS, hosts Marine Corps-specific hardware and software, and it's also run out of this command. And the last IT insertion point for the Navy that we'll cover today is the 10th Fleet, which of course is part of the four service components of U.S. Cybercom. Uh, it serves as the central operational authority for naval networks and information operations and electronic warfare. Now, the Marine Corps is, of course, also represented in the four service components of U.S. Cybercom with their division, the Marine Corps Forces Cyberspace Command, or MAR4 Cybercom. Um, and MAR4 Cybercom is made up of one command element, which is the Marine Corps Network Operations Security Center, or MCNOSC. Uh, now let's move on to some of the contracts that the Navy prefers to leverage for its acquisitions. Uh, Navy, Navy obligates an average of $100 billion a year on contracts. You can see here that Seaport E was the most heavily leveraged vehicle with about six and a half billion dollars in FY12. Now Navy hopes to save hundred million dollars over the next five years through leveraging or more heavily leveraging enterprise license agreements. Microsoft and Oracle signed the first department-wide software ELAs with more soon to follow. Now the hope here is that by leveraging the full purchasing capacity of the department, the Navy and Marine Corps can optimize cost savings. Here's a chart looking at Navy top contractors. You'll see HP, Lockheed, and SAIC are the prime movers and shakers. Um, HP's position is in large part due, the, due to the NMCI continuity of services contract, and then HP did win the NGEN Serv Enterprise Services Award, which is currently under protest. As Tim mentioned, the use of L ELAs are now mandated, <coughs> and the Microsoft and Oracle deals were just the beginning. Um, also, like all other federal agencies, data center consolidation and application rationalization are top priorities. Uh, the Navy plans to close 58 data centers over the next three years, with the remaining uh, enterprise data centers taking on more duties, uh, so we may see more opportunities in virtualization and cloud computing. In fact, Terry Halverson has mandated that the department submit plans for virtualization of all servers and server-based systems and applications by the end of FY17. Uh, finally, strong cybersecurity is high on everyone's list um, as the Navy consolidates its networks and computing platforms. So the first Navy program we wanted to talk about is Engine. Um, the program is run out of PEOC EIS um, under the Naval Enterprise Networks Office. Uh, Philip Anderson, who was the deputy of that office, took over as program manager of Engine this past summer. Uh, and Engine will replace NMCI, which handles 70% of all Navy IT operations and is the largest intranet in the world. Not surprisingly, Navy, Engine is the Navy's largest IT program in terms of investment with nearly $1.8 billion in FY14. Um, right now, as Tim mentioned, the continuity of services contract is maintaining the services that will be assumed by Engine. The Navy sees the acquisition approach uh, for Engine as a path towards aligning, towards, uh, aligning with the JIE's goals of improving operational efficiency, enhancing network security, and cost savings. FY14 work, uh, we'll see work being done on the backbone infrastructure. So obviously this is a very infrastructure, network management, and data, data management heavy opportunity. In addition this year, we're gonna see software licenses purchased via the DOD ESI for up to 300,000 users. And another major investment for the Navy this year is gonna be Canes. So 
uh, Keynes is the afloat counterpart to NGEN. So if NGEN is the Navy's intranet on land, Keynes is going to be the Navy's network afloat um, by 2020. So the Navy's been working with numerous afloat networks, but now they're trying to create a universal computing environment aboard ships for command, control, intelligence, and logistics. Now the thinking behind Keynes is that consolidation, of course, will bring down costs and maintenance requirements and reduce training needs. The program is managed out of PEO C4I and led by Captain DJ Lagoff. Full deployment awards are expected mid-January and they will fund network equipment as well as systems consolidation, virtualization, and systems management products. Now also, the program office's goal is for small business to make up about 37% of the subcontracted effort. And I have to say that this is a notion that we're going to have to be comfortable with. Um, rational or not, DOD's thinking is that small business equals small cost and big business equals big cost. So everyone in this room would behoove themselves um, by establishing partnerships with small business. But uh, that's, that's an aside. Um, the Keynes program will see hardware refreshes every four years and software refreshes every two. And the intent is to use infrastructure and platform as a service so we can be on the lookout for some of those cloud opportunities. Uh, in FY14, the program requested about $410 million, so a lot of funding um, for the coming year. CAX-2S is a theater battle management system. Um, it's managed out of the Marine Corps PEO for land systems, which works closely with Marine Corps Systems Commands and provides closer coordination of the Marine ground and air comp command and control systems and centers. Uh, the system is designed to be scalable and flexible with an open architecture design that can be deployed on just about any type of vehicle. Uh, the program spent about $83.6 million in FY13 and requested about $57 million this year. Um, the program is fully funded and is on track for full deployment in 2015. Some of the priorities for the year, for the year are replacing legacy aviation and command and control equipment. Additionally, program managers are exploring potential hardware and software solutions to replace their aging voice video uh, network system. CAX-2S is designed to provide Marine Corps operators the ability to share voice, video, and sensor data and information to integrate air and ground combat planning and operations. So you can see how CAX-2S contributes to the overall theme, overall focus on developing common operating environments. So that does it for the Navy, and now we'll go ahead and move on to the Army. Got any Army reps in here? Oh, wow. but not that many, huh? Just a few? Got one, one important one over here. Um, so after reaching a high of $144 million in FY10, Army's base budget has normalized a little bit and is back down to $130 billion. Um, now I've heard some folks complain that FY14 total budget levels are exactly equal to FY06 total budget levels. Well, my counter to that is to try to remember that the base budget has actually increased 30% over that time. Um, also try to remember that the Army has a higher IT budget than any other federal entity by $2 billion. Army's IT budget is actually higher than the Department of Commerce's total budget. Um, now, the, the IT budget is flat from last year, um, but that's being tempered for us by an increase in procurement dollars. You can see in the table at the bottom that the majority of the IT spending is done on IT infrastructure and maintenance and battle space networks. And again, this continues to fit in with our themes of supporting the JIE with investments uh, through infrastructure consolidation and developing common operating environments. Now, some estimates put the total addressable IT market within the Army at about $15 billion, with the addressable market for software products at about a billion and a half for the year. Now, as you all know, Army is just an enormous enterprise. They employ well over a million people. Um, so today we're only going to have time to highlight a few of the relevant IT insertion points, but of course, um, other insertion points will be included in your territory planner. And again, I, even though we mentioned it four or five times throughout the presentation, we always have people ask us, how do we get the planner? How do we get the planner? After the presentation today, fill your survey out online and you'll have the planner emailed to you. Um, so the Army CIO G6 office, it's like any other six. Uh, it sets policy and standards for the rest of the agency to follow. Now that includes any and all relation, uh, issues related to information management and network operations and equipping signal forces. Of course, um, General Lawrence's big push over the last several years has been network modernization. Um, now there have been a few personnel changes at the G6 in the past year. Uh, most recently, of course, was Lieutenant General Susan Lawrence's retirement, so Mike Krieger has stepped in as the acting G6. Uh, we believe we know who Lieutenant General Lawrence's full-time replacement is going to be, but we're not going to preempt the Army's announcement in this forum today. Um, additionally, Colonel Keith June replaced Major General James Walton as the Chief Integration Officer. 
Dean Fultzer replaced Teresa Salazar at the Policy and, and Resources Office, and then Pete, uh, Brigadier General Pete Gallagher is now the Acting Commander General, Commanding General of NETCOM um, when Major General Alan Lynn left for DISA. Uh, lastly, Brigadier General Joseph Brendler replaced Richard Cerny at the Architecture Operations Networks and Space Office. And within that office, located in the lower left uh, part of your uh, slide here, sits the Army Architecture Integration Center, led by Gary Blome. Now, Gary told me last month that the G6 is on track to close 185 data centers by FY15, um, and their major areas of focus besides data center consolidation over the next two years are going to be on implementing common operating environments, leveraging standardized and open architectures, and assisting DISA with their mobility pilot. Now, mobility, of course, is an important topic across all of DOD, um, but also in, in Army as well, because they really want to collect and share data in real time. They want to foster a more productive and untethered workforce. But Gary said that the problem is that we don't have adequate solutions for securing the data. So unfortunately, in his mind at least, we still have a long way to go before true mobility can be realized and before BYOD can become a reality. Now we can take a look at Army Cyber Command, uh, which recently underwent a major personnel change. Uh, was Lieutenant General uh, Rhett Hernandez passing the torch to Lieutenant General Edward Cardin. Uh, headquartered at Fort Belvoir, our cyber was stood up in October of 2010 with the purpose of defending the Army in cyberspace. Uh, the command employs 21,000 soldiers and additional civilian and contractor personnel, uh, plus all of the employees from subordinate commands, INSCOM and NETCOM. Based out of Fort Huachuca and led by Brigadier General Pete Gallagher, NETCOM is the Army's IT service provider and cyber protection force. NETCOM defends and operates Army cyberspace while protecting and improving the land war net to allow mission command capabilities for the Army. NETCOM employs over 16,000 soldiers plus civilian and contractor employees who run network operations for the Army and Joint Forces. Of particular interest to the COTS vendors um, is the six, Seventh Signal Command, headquartered at Fort Gordon, which provides Army Enterprise Network capability in CONUS. Additionally, the Seventh manages 45 Network Enterprise Centers, or NECs. Uh, the NECs are divided up into, into different regions and are responsible for, provi for providing local C4 and information management support. Aside from the Seventh, you also want to take a look at the AG NOSC which is the Network Operations and Security Center of NETCOM. And now we can switch gears and talk about some of the procurement and program management offices within the Army. Um, so ASALT fields and sustains equipment for the Army. Uh, led by Heidi Shu, ASALT is based here in D.C. and employs over 42,000 people um, who are essential to the Army's acquisition process. Now ASALT runs six major offices, 10 PEOs, and has a dotted line um, to PEO EIS. Together, these components provide oversight of the life cycle management and sustainment of technology and weapon systems for the Army. Now, depending on what types of products you sell, um, almost any of these offices could be, offer an opportunity for you, but most likely the most widely relevant offices are going to be PEO EIS, PEO C3T, um, IEWNS, and uh, maybe Soldier and Stry. Again, some of these will cover, some of them we don't have time to cover, uh, but will be included in your territory planner. Now, taking a look at PEO C3T, um, they have an annual budget of $3 billion and has a workforce of uh, 1,600 personnel. And they uh, develop, deliver, and support more than 40 major Army programs, providing soldiers with communications networks, radios, satellite systems, and other hardware and software that they require to communicate on the battlefield. Now, the PEO maintains tactical communications networks, supporting the Army's transition to a smaller but still highly capable force. The Army recognizes that the network is completely critical to both leaders and soldiers to providing the right information at the right time to enable decision making and mission success. Now, there have been two notable personnel changes at C3T recently. Uh, General Lee Price handed over leadership of the PEO to Brigadier General Daniel Hughes just this September. And then uh, the product project director for communication security also changed hands with Stanley Nemich replacing Chris Manning. For those of you that aren't familiar with PD Comsec, they provide uh, procurement for products that secure Army networks um, in support of daily garrison network operations and global contingency operations as well. So obviously a good target for your infrastructure and security folks out there. Um, and then the final acquisition organization we'll cover within the Army is PEO EIS, uh, led by Doug Wiltsey at Fort Belvoir. EIS employs 1,300 people who manage about 30% of the Army's IT budget. Uh, they spread that budget across 30 programs that focus on enterprise infrastructure, backbone communications, 
business systems, and biometrics IT systems. Recent personnel changes in this office include Colonel Harry Kulklisher, replacing Colonel Pat Flanders as ASIP program manager. Now within that ASIP office, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Romero replaced Lieutenant Colonel Chris Domke as GCSS program manager. Now the major concerns for EIS over the years have been cloud, uh, converged cloud infrastructure, mobility, big data, and security. Now we're hearing that Army infrastructure, as we all know, is currently decentralized and extremely fragmented with multiple data centers just servicing multiple uh, service posts, camps, stations, and various virtual end users. But moving forward, EIS wants to assist in reducing the cost of these stovepiped IT systems, improving enterprise services, network access, um, and uh, for an improved security posture. Also, they'll, they'll rely on their enterprise data centers for enterprise email, um, and unified communications, and identity management. Now, there's not a single technology segment that's not going to find a home at some place within EIS. Um, doesn't matter if you're focused on applications, data management, BPM solutions, or infrastructure, or security, whatever you name it, at some point EIS is going to buy it. And the Army is similar to the Air Force and Navy in that it leverages a lot of BPAs against initiatives like ESI. And it also has a number of large IDIQ vehicles like S3 and ITES, uh, and that it uses to support major programs and to buy IT products. Despite the, despite the fact that S3 and these other six contract vehicles are the most heavily leveraged, they only represent about 6.5% of total contract spending across the Army. It's worth noting that ITES uh, 3S released a special notice earlier this year and is expected to release an RFP sometime in the next quarter. Uh, this will be a $25 billion nine-year MAC that will buy IT solutions and products, including C4ISR products and services. Although the original award data uh, date was expected to be at the end of this year, uh, the Chess Office told us a realistic date to expect for award would be summer of 2015. Taking a look at the Army's top contractors, um, no surprises there, Lockheed, Boeing, SAIC, Booz, all in the top 25. Um, whether they're building weapon systems, integrating technology solutions, information systems, or some other specialty, um, these are the major SIs that a software and hardware product company may want to consider targeting for sell-through and sell-to opportunities. So what will be influencing Army's buying activity this year? Um, well, I've got to say that things haven't really changed dramatically over the last few years. Um, at the TechNet conference, Major, Major General Harold Green, who's Deputy for Acquisitions and Systems Management, said that more than ever, budgets are going to be affecting how Army makes its decisions, and if a program doesn't execute, they're going to be making quicker decisions to make sure that it's not a program for very long. Um, another, another major uh, force driving Army acquisitions will be network modernization. Um, again, if you've heard uh, General Lawrence speak at any point over the past several years, you know that the land war net is just the key to the future of the Army. Um, network modernization has effectively increased bandwidth and allowed for cost savings, which is why this effort continues to receive funds despite budget concerns. And the Army wants to connect installations in a cloud environment as well. Um, EIS did release an RFI back in March for an elastic cloud capability for enterprise level content management. So what this means is that they're trying to find vendors who can provide cloud-based content repository, enterprise search, records and documents management, and BPM solutions. Now initially, EIS thought that there might be an RFP issued early on in FY14, uh, but they told me a few weeks ago that they're still reviewing responses to the RFI. Um, then of course, we can't talk cloud computing without talking about data center consolidation. And uh, General Joseph Brendler at the G6 told me earlier this month that Army recently increased its count of data centers and uh, consolidation is just an even bigger project than anybody had initially anticipated. So objectives around consolidation are just gonna have to be that much more aggressive. Um, even though the Army has saved nearly $30 million in the past year from cloud efforts, what remains a challenge for um, COTS vendors is, is that these types of initiatives just require heavy upfront investment for the customer. So even if the agencies are realizing um, ROI within two or three years, it's just hard for them to justify making that upfront purchase when their budgets are already being squeezed. Um, so for the time being, I'd recommend staying close to General Brendler and Mike Krieger because remember, any software application and any system that's hosted at the data center level is going to require G6 approval. And now onto the programs. Uh, I know from my experience working with D6 uh, during my deployments overseas with DIA that it was a valuable tool for compiling all source intelligence and identifying tactics, techniques, and procedures of various groups that were conducting attacks against U.S. troops. Uh, 
D6 is a joint program that started in 2001 to provide ISR management to analysts and decision makers uh, to support information sharing and situational awareness. Uh, in the past, analysts had, analysts had to go to multiple disparate stations to monitor sensor data. The data was all stovepiped, and so you can see why this created a problem when trying to collect and share intelligence. Uh, its new round of funding will span 2007 through 2033. Um, D6A will have nearly $300 million in DME funds for FY14 alone. This program, though, has been heavily scrutinized over the past uh, years for high cost and poor performance and is under scrutiny to leverage more capable COT solutions. But D6A is the poster child of the DOD drivers that we discussed earlier in the presentation because it fuses satellite imagery, signals, and human intelligence to improve situational awareness. It also creates a common view uh, and shares information, and all of this requires storage, information management, and cloud solutions. In fact, this may be one of the Army's larger cloud efforts with millions of dollars in cloud-related contracts being awarded to Compaq Federal, which is now HP, and Northrop Grumman over the past couple of years. So you can really see how this investment is relevant to those bigger picture initiatives that contribute to the overall vision of the JIE. So we did present on this investment last year, and as Lloyd mentioned, you can find uh, the FY13 budget briefing on MX Group's website, it's just www.mxgroup.com. Um, but I, th I think we'd be remiss if we left it out this year. So the three increments of the WIND-T program will spend a combined total of $1.3 billion in FY14. Uh, as we showed earlier, the WIND-T program office sits within PEO C3T. This program's uh, led by Ernel, uh, Colonel Ed Swanson, and it's actually responsible for the execution of 14 different programs, including GTACs, Phoenix, and GBS. Now, WIND-T Increment 1 is led by Product Manager Lieutenant Colonel Joel Babbitt. And Inc. 1 integrates COTS and GOTS solutions um, into satellite communications packages to help warfighters with tactical communication. WIND-T Inc. 2, which is led by Lieutenant Colonel Robert Collins, improves upon Inc. 1 uh, to provide on-the-move capability. Now, this piece of the program extends the network by delivering the mobile capability with greater network reliability. Um, and then finally, Inc. 3, led by Lieutenant Colonel Ward Roberts, connects users from the theater and company levels to the DISN with an aerial tier. Now, implementing an aerial tier allows for a reduction in satellite traffic, which saves on costs and gives the Army the ability to use bandwidth resources elsewhere. Now, implementation for these products, for all three increments, has been done by General Dynamics, with some support from Viasat and Lockheed Martin. Now, the program is funded from 2007 through 2025 and will have ongoing needs for network administration and management, C4ISR solutions, data protection, and of course, information assurance. And the last Army investment we're going to cover is going to be the I3MP program, um, which is another network infrastructure modernization effort. Uh, and this one's currently bringing unified communications to Army bases around the world. I3MP provides soldiers with the IT infrastructure that they need by leveraging COT standards and products um, to create a network-centric enterprise unified capability. It is part of PEO EIS's strategic investments between now and FY19 to improve network capacity and communications. Uh, I3MP is supported by the IMOD acquisition, which is actually a group of 10 different IDIQs held by 10 different companies, uh, so General Dynamics, AT&T, uh, Verizon, and SAIC to name a few. Uh, the program has received a large increase in DME funding for the year and will spend $230 million on installations at 10 different bases. Now, providers of security products, telecom products, and network management products are going to find opportunities here. Also, obviously, collaboration tools and cloud providers will be needed in the coming year for I3MP. And now we'll move to DHA. It's an agency that didn't exist last year. It was formerly the military health system. Uh, this agency oversees an expanse of 56 hospitals and over 360 clinics, and al serving almost 10 million beneficiaries. It operates worldwide and employs over 150,000 civilian and military personnel. The total request this fiscal year for the DOD unified medical budget that supports DHA was $49.4 billion, up slightly from last year's request. Uh, the IT budget also saw, saw a slight uptick due to in part to revisions on how the department will procure an electronic health record, which we'll get to shortly. On the BRM front, healthcare delivery services is the dominant category, no surprise there. Um, that's where the major health record information systems lie. 
So for a little more background on DHA, um, in 2006, Congress recommended collapsing the services surgeons general and the various health organizations into one unified health command. Now the problems with this plan are both operational and cultural. Um, so, you know, the Navy's trained to deliver care to units afloat and to deployed Marines. Um, the Air Force has expertise in aerial platforms, and Army docs are trained to deliver medical ground support in combat theaters. And additionally, Army just wants to do things the way Army does things. Navy just wants to do things the way Navy does it. Um, but despite cultural differences uh, across the service branches, DOD really wanted a, a new governance structure for the military health enterprise that would help to slow down the growth of cost. Um, so DHA was created to reduce redundancies across the separate medical commands um, by combining, where possible, the functions for purchasing logistics and IT. Now, creating a DHA also allows DOD to improve its ability to expand shared services to create common businesses and clinical practices. DHA's future operating model will consolidate all IT health operations, so that includes IT management, infrastructure, and applications. DHA plans to save over $600 million over the next six years, and to do that, they're planning for three years of targeted investment in hardware, software, and infrastructure consolidation as well as application rationalization. So you can see the services in the end retain their medical commands, again, to better suit their unique requirements. Um, DHA is focused on the primary mission of medical readiness and will be responsive to the combatant commanders uh, through a formal oversight process that's established by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, Lieutenant General Douglas Robb was sworn in recently as the first DHA Director. Uh, his deputy is Alan Middleton. Mr. Middleton had been serving as the key transition director for the stand-up of the DHA. Um, Dave Bowen remains the CIO, uh, although he adds responsibility as Director of the Health IT Directorate. And the Acting Director of the Business Support Directorate is Colonel Darrell Landreau. Colonel Landreau recently arrived from the Office of the Air Force Surgeon General. Here's a top-level overview of the Defense Health Clinical Systems. Um, this is a new organization having stood up in April um, and replaces what was, the, what was DHIMS, the Defense Health Information Management System. Uh, their mission is to sustain the current EHR suite of IT applications and systems. Um, the EHR Core PMO, Program Management Office, develops and manages information management tools that capture and share health data across DOD. Also, the data sharing PMO oversees efforts um, to work with the VA to ensure medical data uh, for service members transitioning to the VA is shared. And finally, the deployment and readiness systems PMO develops and sustains mission critical IT capabilities that transmit health information for wounded warriors as they transit from the battlefield to the care facility. And that office is led by Charles Updegrove. Um, now moving on to the Defense Health Services Systems, or DHSS, uh, which is the largest health IT acquisition shop for DHA. Now this office provides DHA with clinical support, medical logistics, and resource management to support applications that maintain warfighter readiness and optimize the delivery of health care uh, to DOD service members. Now the Medical Logistics Division, as its name suggests, ensures that medical commodities get to the battlefield or to the required uh, DOD facility. Now this division provides special needs management systems and electronic health care reporting. Uh, the Resources Division contains the centralized data store for DHA and their other roles include managing products that support medical coding collections, personnel management, and other resource management tools. Now, the Enterprise Infrastructure Office is kind of new, kind of not. It was previously known as the MHS Cyber Infrastructure Services Office, and it manages uh, the overarching IT infrastructure and support services for all of DHA's centrally managed information systems. Now, the EI Office uh, manages the network layer and all of the computing infrastructure uh, for the support services for DHA. The EI Division offers DHA users email, mobile device support, collaborative software, and shared storage uh, of user contact information. Now, DHA obligates about 10 to $12 billion a year on contracts. Uh, spent about $27 million last year through GSA Schedule 70. Uh, DCITMS 3 was a contract vehicle heavily leveraged by MHS. Um, it's expiring this fiscal year, and there are no plans to recompete that contract. Uh, so the agencies have said that they're going to be utilizing various other acquisition methods and vehicles such as GSA and CIO SP3. 
Uh, here's a quick look at the DHA top IT specific contractors. Uh, this is by no means an all-inclusive list. Uh, the overall rundown is dominated by healthcare companies, as you can imagine. Uh, Plan Systems International, which you see there, is a prime on the uh, previously mentioned DSIDMS 3. Um, also, when the integrated electronic health record effort is stood up and becomes a reality, uh, systems made simple will provide SI and engineering support. Among its drivers, an integrated electronic health record, or IEHR, is the number one priority for the agency. Uh, the department wants to develop a seamless electronic exchange of healthcare information in a secure and private format uh, between DOD and VA. Uh, there have been roadblocks, but the ultimate goal is a unified EHR system that will ensure all DOD and VA health facilities have both active duty and veterans health information available throughout their lifetime. VA's virtual lifetime electronic record is very similar, um, although that's more geared towards medical record sharing with private providers. Now, one of the driving forces for the establishment of DHA was to drive down cost. Um, the military is now spending just as much on health benefits as they do on salaries. So General Rob and his team will be looking at industry for ways to streamline processes and reduce complex operations, all while achieving actual cost reductions. Finally, ensuring that DHA's systems are secure, especially the future EHR, is a top priority for Dave Bowen and his CIO team. So as Lloyd briefly mentioned on his driver slide, uh, the goal of the IEHR program is to create a comprehensive electronic health record um, in concert with the VA. Of course, in 2009, as we all remember, President Obama directed DOD and VA to build a seamless way for a service member to no longer have to physically walk paperwork from a duty station uh, to a local VA health center. Um, now, what was the EHR Way Ahead program was slated to go into effect by 2017 uh, with a price tag of about $4 billion. But unfortunately in February, both the VA and the DOD went their separate ways um, with DOD focusing on a replacement for its legacy healthcare IT system citing technology challenges and skyrocketing costs. Now despite setbacks this year, the vision for an integrated solution still remains alive, uh, but the higher priority for the time being will be replacing Alta, which is DOD's legacy EHR system. Um, although the Pentagon hasn't entirely discarded the idea of adopting EHR, uh, uh, VA's EHR system, uh, they are openly looking to industry um, for options for COT solutions. Now, in fact, this week, DOD is hosting demonstrations for possible replacements. Christopher Miller is overseeing management of this effort as the PEO for healthcare management system modernization. Uh, TMIPJ extends the functions of DHA's information systems here to the deployment and deployed environment, including the battlefield. Uh, the program is designed to enable uh, tactical access to the electronic health, health record, as well as medical logistics and patient tracking capabilities. In keeping with the overall theme of common operating picture, another way to describe this program is as a, com a medical command and control, if you will, that will allow health professionals to capture and aggregate data and conduct trends analysis. The program and the system are designed to adapt also to whatever specific theater requirements are needed. Um, the president requested about $100 million this year. That's a slight uptick over last year. Um, spending will go towards systems supporting new medical equipment and customer assistance modules that are going to be sent to the theater. Um, we're also going to see monies go towards licensing, testing, and program management of their existing portfolio, such as the tactical version of Alta. Now, speaking of ALTA, you have information uh, on ALTA in the planner as well as other aspects of DHA, but in the interest of time, um, we're not going to cover it. We're in the home stretch, folks. How are we doing? I don't, I don't think I've seen anybody fall asleep. I don't think we've lost anybody, and I don't see too much iPhone praying, so I'm happy. I'm happy with the engagement. Thanks. Um, but the last agency that we'll cover today is uh, DISA. Uh, as we all know, DISA is a combat support agency that provides C2 and information capabilities to the warfighter. Uh, DISA employs 6,000 employees and is based up at Fort Meade. Their total operating budget for FY14 is going to be $9.4 billion. Um, about 10% of DISA's budget is distributed between new, new procurement and RDT&E in the coming year. Uh, the IT budget request this year is $5.2 billion, which is nearly a 5% increase over last year. Now you can see that web infrastructure is far and away the largest BRM category, followed by IT infrastructure maintenance uh, and battle space networks. 
Now, DISA did experience a pretty significant reorganization this year so that it could be better aligned with the JIE. Um, so bear with me for a little while because I know that this is interesting for people who cover DISA. Um, for those of you uh, who don't cover DISA, you might want to go ahead and pray to your iPhone for a bit. Um, so to begin with, the new office for the JIE was uh, created under Brigadier General Brian Dravis, serving, at, ser serving as the director of the Joint Technical Synchronization Office. Um, Dave Stickley is head of the new JIE Compliance Office. The CIO and Enterprise Services Directorates have been merged, and the new office and a new office was created within Enterprise Services for CRM. Now, these moves are aimed to provide an end-to-end -end solution for the provision and implementation of Enterprise Services. Dave Bennett is going to remain the CIO, but he's going to take on additional responsibilities, replacing Alfred Rivera as head of the Enterprise Services Directorate or the ESD. Alfred Rivera's new role is as Vice Director of the Strategic Planning Group under Tony Montemorano. Um, Tony Montemorano's office, the Strategic Planning Group, was consolidated into DISA's Financial Management Office in order to better align program objectives with financial execution. The Field Security Office was consolidated into PEO Mission Assurance, which is overseen by Mark Orndorff. And the DEC operations were moved into the Operations Directorate under Larry Huffman, who is now in charge of day-to-day -day operations for the DECs. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, Major General Alan Lynn uh, left Army Netcom to assume the role of Vice Director of DISA, replacing Rear Admiral David Simpson. Now, as I just mentioned, Dave Bennett is still serving as DISA CIO, um, but he did also take over for Alfred, Director, uh, Alfred Rivera as Director of the ESD. Um, ESD supports over 3 million people that use over 2,800 applications, using, leveraging more than 3.7 petabytes of storage. ESD provides processing capability, communications, and storage to support DOD services and actually has become DOD's main provider uh, of personnel, logistics, accounting, and medical records processing. Now offices for uh, COTS vendors to target within ESD are going to be the technical program office because it oversees deployment and implementation of the ESD's technical architecture. I'd also point out the CIO's office um, because it of course provides the focal point of governance for ESD and DISA's DECs. Now let's take a look at PEO MA, our mission assurance led by Mark Orndorff. Uh, PEO MA manages information assurance and network operations capabilities for DOD. It provides secure and interoperable net-centric solutions necessary to secure and operate the global information grid or GIG. The NetOps division supports COCOMs and joint forces in decision-making and mission assurance by providing technical leadership to enhance situational awareness Next, the CND Solutions Division provides security and computer network defense, along with situational awareness of the gig through acquiring and fielding network security products and solutions. Lastly, the Identi Identity Management Division provides encryption, biometrics, applications, and business process management for their customers to maintain DOD's public key infrastructure. Finally, within DISA, you'll want to approach PEO C2C, led by Martin Gross. Uh, C2C provides lifecycle management of the C2 portfolio, including GEEKS, GCSS, JC2, and MNIS. Both GEEKS and GCSS provide a joint logistics common operational picture to make sure support is in the right place at the right time. And going back to our overarching drivers of interoperability and common operating pictures, you can see that DISA is at the center of it all. Their goal is to have one system that can pull from multiple data sources to provide one complete picture. And here we've listed out DISA's top 10 contract vehicles. Uh, most of their spending is dedicated to IT. The vehicle with the highest utilization was Encore 2, um, with Alliant SB coming in second, which both account for more than the rest of the top 10 contract vehicles combined. Now, in terms of contractors, DISA spreads its work pretty evenly across a number of different companies, although SAIC is the, the uh, most largely leveraged company. Of course, DISA released a strategic plan uh, for 2013 to 2018 last September with the purpose of identifying strategic goals and key objectives. Uh, the agency addressed four cross-cutting goals and eight strategic shifts that we covered during last year's briefing. Um, and those goals and shifts are all reflected in DISA's FY14 budget documents. Um, it's clear that they recognize a the need to transition to a network-centric environment to improve how information is shared across DOD. They specifically called out a need to eliminate bandwidth constraints and to improve infrastructure. 
and the agency will continue to emphasize a data center consolidation, shrinking their data centers, their inventory, from 194 to 12. DISA is also looking at reworking its acquisition practices to cut cost as well. It plans to rely on a more heavily uh, centralized strategy, leveraging a few multiple award contracts and multiple award vehicles that will purchase more commercial IT products and focus purchasing around interoperable capabilities. Now moving on to DISA's programs, uh, GeeksJ is an investment run out of PEO C2C. It's a command and control investment, joint command and control investment that produces enhancements to the joint operations planning and execution system, or JOPS. It consists of hardware, software, interfaces, and standards that provide intelligence and planning information. And this program is focused on reducing sustainment costs through appropriate COTS and agile development products. Lieutenant Colonel John Dukes said that the pro program costs will overrun if Geeks doesn't utilize more COTS solutions. Uh, last year, they began a COTS tech refresh to man minimize the impact of end-of-life issues and provided software updates enterprise-wide. Now, one of the major strategies to realize more savings in the future is to leverage more open source products. Although this has been a point of contention um, in, in the recent past uh, due to security concerns. Uh, the investment began in 1995 and will end in 2018 and will spend almost $220 million in FY14. Um, SAIC and Northrop have both won awards in support of GeeksJ through Encore 2. This is Network Services Directorate, led by Cindy Moran, supports global voice, video, messaging, and data networks. And this is one of the offices we weren't able to get to talk about today, but Network Services is responsible for a number of duties, such as evolving gig networks, transport, Nipper and Cipernet sustainment, and of course, the DISN. The DISN is the, the network that allows for data exchange and interoperability to mission partners, including voice, video, VPN, transport, and messaging. In FY14, the DISN program has over $2.1 billion in funds, and program manager Jesse Showers plans to continue with a tech refresh of end-of-life equipment and infrastructure upgrades. They'll be implementing improved architecture to support a growing number of connected devices and users. Uh, the major contractors that have supported the DISN program have been SAIC, Harris, and AT&T and they will be integral in the purchase of network and systems development and management, as well as enterprise architecture and network security products for the coming year. Now the final this uh, program that we'll cover today is the DEX investment. Um, as you all know, the 12 enterprise data centers provide mainframe and server processing operations, data storage, and C4 capabilities across all of the DOD. Uh, the DEC investment is a huge part of DOD's efforts to rationalize computing at the enterprise level, thereby improving efficiency. Now, with the exception of the Navy, all of the DOD is moving towards using, using these core data centers that absorb the functions of the disparate component data centers. Uh, DIS's DECs in CONUS, as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, do provide the backbone for the JIE infrastructure. They facilitate the implementation of the data center consolidation initiative, um, and they host enterprise and cloud services. Now, with the closure of the Chambersburg and the Dayton sites, the total number of decks comes to 12. That's nine CONUS, three OCONUS, and the locations uh, of the decks will be included in your territory planner. Now, the next year will hold a lot in store for the decks, including upgrading storage capacity, improving data center monitoring, and improving connectivity to blade servers. Additionally, they'll shoot to increase network bandwidth, consistency, and standardization. Um, the decks still fall under DISA's enterprise services purview, and they're managed by Matt McLaughlin. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, General Hawkins announced that day-to-day -day operations for the decks are going to be run by Larry Huffman at the operations directorate. Now, in the coming year, DISA has over $1.2 billion to spend on the program, so it's very well funded. So that's it. To wrap things up, um, I wanted to repeat a few things that we mentioned in the sequestration briefing back in March. Um, as we all know, budgets are flat. That's our new reality, um, which is something we have to get used to. And the fat cats uh, that gained a bunch of weight over the last 15 years from all of that bloated OCO funding are going to have to readjust. They're going to have to change their pricing to reflect tighter budgets across all of the DOD. But luckily, the budgets that most of us are concerned about have remained mostly safe. And to get a piece of that pie, 
you're going to have to make sure that you get all of your ducks in a row. So please, I encourage you to leverage the information that we provided here today. Um, understanding your market can never be, the value of understanding your market can never be undervalued. Um, stay close to your customer. Again, it's, it's never more important uh, to listen to your customer's pain points. Attack the IT insertion points we covered today where the decision makers have ample budgets and can make new purchases. Um, make sure to keep open communication with your customer from the executive level to the program level to the end user level so that you can be influencing requirements at all three. And remember, before you forecast any deals, there are a few critical questions that you need to have answered. What budget account is funding this investment? Who in the program office is working this deal with the controller? Have you completed a market survey and has brand specific justification been completed if necessary? And are the requirements clearly defined and locked down? Now, if you're comfortable with the answers to all this, these questions, I think you're probably in pretty good shape for your deals for this year. And with that, we'll end here. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. And best of luck in FY14.